Uh, so we're going to turn to Acts chapter 20. We, we started Acts going through the book of Acts uh, quite some time ago. And I was just excited to look at the early church. I felt I was in a, a place where I'm like, okay, God, um, what's next? What's next? How, how are we to be applying ourselves out there in the world? And so when I started going through this with you all, I did not expect it to open my eyes to what the early church went through the way it has. And I did not expect to see so many similarities in the early church that we still see today. Not a lot has changed uh, from the way the Holy Spirit continues to move and create unity among those who love them, along with so many challenges that we still face day to day. One thing is for sure, in the last several chapters we've been reading, God has used the Apostle Paul to create a foundation of churches that will stand in very dark places. He's building up and leaving disciples that will go forth and declare the goodness of God and the saving power of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you guys, you might not be called to be a church planter or a preacher or a missionary, but you are called. We are all called to sow seed and be disciple makers. We've seen that from a host of names in this book of people in all walks of life. And the one thing they had in common, the one thing that all tied it together was that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and were just willing to submit their lives to him and say, God, whatever you have, whatever you want to do. Now we see Paul at the end of his stay in Ephesus. He was, as we read in last week, the subject of an unruly mob there who would have killed him if they could have gotten their hands on him. And that's where we start in Acts 20, verse 1. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. So Paul, he's been through harder stuff than any of us. I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, I, have, I have had days in ministry where I'm like, it's hard. But then I remember that the whole town didn't show up and was like, let's kill him. So <laughs> not yet, not yet. Um, so Paul is, Paul has been through some stuff. Um, if you recall, you know, he's been put in stocks and imprisoned repeatedly. Uh, he was beaten unto the point of death and then just got back up and went back into town. He's been through hard stuff and yet he never, I'm amazed by this, never stops encouraging the disciples in the church. He knows that being an early Christian is not easy. It's been a nonstop tour of explosive gospel growth followed immediately by swift persecution from the world. So Paul keeps making time to go back to churches he's planted and he keeps encouraging them. What does that encouragement look like? Most often it's going to be through the word of God and prayer. Guys, we cannot get enough reminders about the promises of God. I forget from time to time, and I thank God I have a wife and a church that are here to remind me. Uh, Roots Youth Group, we we did a thing for a whole year and a half, a long, very long time, where we just went down the list of, of this is God's love letter to us, starting in Genesis 1-1, all the way down through the prophets. And we would just go through it point by point. And we hadn't done it in a while, like since, the, since May, I think. And I, we have it all written in bullet points on the board. And I pulled it out, and I'm like, tell me the story. And I'm like, in the beginning, and they're like, God did some stuff. And it's like, yep, okay. And it's just amazing how much we need those reminders, how much we need that refresher, that encouragement. Um, so we do, we get together, we remind ourselves about the promises of God, that we can stand firm on his word. But other times, it might just be over a meal 
or sitting silently at a hospital bed, or attending a wedding or a funeral, or asking questions uh, about God at your workplace, or a whole bunch of other ways we lift each other up and help us along with our love of God, our love of people, and our need to make disciples. Paul was a nonstop encouragement machine. Even in the face of all adversity, even in times where, guys, in my flesh, I can't tell you, If I had been Paul, how tired and sick of it I would have been. And Paul's just like, man, remember how much God loves us. Remember what he's doing for us. Remember the miracles. Remember his his, uh, son that died on the cross for our sins. It's just nonstop, and he keeps going. Verse 2, he traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people. And finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months because some Jews had plotted against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to go back through Macedonia. Uh, Paul goes about speaking about the love of God. And in doing so, he's targeted by Jews who would kill him. They have a plan to get him this time. And it's being put into action, but Paul finds out about it and he changes his travel plans at the last minute. He backtracks, actually heading back the way he'd just come. Verse 4, he was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea. These names matter, guys. This is a cool list we're about to read. Aristarchus and Secondus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Go ahead, you say it. And Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. I love that list of names. Not just because they're, you know, so many of them are very hard to pronounce, um, but think about it. Think about it. Back in Acts 16, Paul left with a fellow Jew named Barnabas. And now, here in chapter 20, we see a new list of names, each followed by the place where Paul met them, where he discipled them, where he ministered to them. And a seed was planted in each life that was just listed there. And that seed fell on fertile soil and it produced fruit. And that fruit is now accompanying Paul on his journey back to Jerusalem. That fruit is encouraging Paul now. That, that fruit, man, that is such a blessing for him to see. And now we get to a passage that all preachers love and anyone that has ever fallen asleep in church dreads. Verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. How many, <laughs> how many of you would like a six-hour church service? That's just preaching, by the way. That's just straight preaching. This is the the first mention of the body of Christ gathering on a regular basis on a Sunday. All these chapters, and this is the first mention of it, uh, meeting on a Sunday. That's a reminder to all of us that the meeting uh, of the body is not just a one day, one specific day a week thing. It's on a particular day. It happens every time we get together to encourage and remind each other of the fulfillment of the covenant promise. And... This church in Acts 20, it meets, and they break bread. And they remember the body of Jesus broken and his blood shed on that cross in the cup. And then Paul begins to preach. And Paul knows that this is the last time he'll see these people. (sighs) Those moments when we know it's the last time. It hits different, doesn't it? If I, you know, if, if I knew this was going to be the last time I was going to see certain children, who I won't look at right now. Shut your mouth. Um, I would give as much information, as much wisdom, as much love as I possibly could for as long as I could. That's what Paul's doing here to this this church. All these people that showed up, and they just 
He just is like, this is the gospel. This, this, is, this is what scripture says. This is, these are the answers you're looking for, people. Um, this is what you should be seeking. This is how to be faithful. This is how to draw near to God. Uh, and so he makes every moment count here. He knows harder things are coming. And so he wants them to be ready. He wants them to be prepared. He wants to reach every heart that is open to the gospel. So Paul preaches, and he preaches, and given the time of day he starts, and it says that he kept uh, talking till midnight, we know it was for at least six hours. Guys, I have had people tell me, if I spoke 20 minutes, that was too long. They're like, yeah, the Bible's good, but we, you know, all we can get in 20 minutes, that's all our brains can fill, and then and we got to go. And I'm like, you will watch a two and a half hour movie without any complaints whatsoever. But man, preach longer than 20 minutes sometimes. And we're like, I have things to do. Yeah? Are they the things that are going to revitalize and restore your soul? Are they going to be the things that remind you of, of God's goodness and his covenant promise and, and the thing that he wants us to do, which is die to our flesh and go out there and serve him, to be disciple makers, to follow hard after the things of God? Our flesh, however, it will say, I'm just as guilty as this as anybody else. Our flesh will say, Five minutes of prayer, that's really hard. I'm sleepy at 30 seconds. Dear Jesus, I love you. I'm so very tired now. Or I'll pick up our Bible. Oh man, I used to have my devotion time. Anybody else do this stupid, stupid thing? You had your devotion time right before you went to bed. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the... And your flesh is just out. You're like, oh man, your flesh does not like to spend time with the things of God. One of the hardest times to wake up in the week, Sunday morning. Why? Because your flesh does not want to be in the presence of God. Meanwhile, your spirit is crying out for it. It's saying, I want to be told. I want to put eyes on scripture. I want to remember and be reminded and I want to cry out to him and I want to, I want to have hands laid on me and I want to pray and I want, to, I want to seek him. I want to know him more. These people gather in this upper room and they stay to hear this and they listen to this man who showed up and he was the first one who told them who Jesus is and what he did but there's more to the story. So Paul keeps going, preaching hour after hour, explaining and answering questions. In verse 8, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting, where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. As Paul talked on and on, when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Uh, Luke, the author of Acts, really sets the scene there. He says, you know, the, the lamps, they're hot and flickering. You know, it's, there's a lot of people in this room. Place is packed out. A lot of body heat in the air. Um, and Eutychus is lucky enough to, he's at least got a window seat. Um, the language here, though, used is that he's fighting sleep. He didn't just curl up on that windowsill with the, the thing of taking a nap. No, he's sitting there wanting to hear what Paul is saying. This young man showed up and stayed for hours and hours and hours and is hungry and thirsty for the things of God. And he's there and he's, he's fighting his flesh. He doesn't want to miss what Paul is saying, but his eyes are so very tired. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is now falling from a third story window. And the people rush out, and Eutychus is declared dead. Now, I don't know about you, but that is usually going to put a stop to most, most church services, right? Uh, well, someone died. Time to call it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just so we know protocol, guys. Um, 
If anything shows that the Holy Spirit is not done with this church service, it's what happens next. You think death can stop the gospel? Can stop the glory of God being made known? It can't. Because the good news is all about the fact that Jesus took the keys to sin and death. And if the Holy Spirit says church ain't done, it's going to take more than a third story fall to stop it. But in fact, nothing can stop it. Jesus declared it in Matthew 16, 18, telling Peter that upon this rock I will build the church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You know what overcomes? The blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony about how I met Jesus and about how he keeps being true and faithful and good. So verse 10 should come as no surprise. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate after talking until daylight. He left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So Paul just says, nope, God says he's fine, gets him up, goes back, preaches for another six hours. Guys, 12-hour church service. But I think if you just saw a man raised back to life, you'd be like, okay, I am, I'm much, much more alert now and ready to hear what is going on. What should have been the end of church ends up being a catalyst for people to lean in more, to listen harder, to not miss a word because the spirit of God was hovering in that upper room. The spirit of God followed that man down three stories, revived him so he could get more church. He decides when the service is over because now that they're leaning forward and someone is more than ready to receive than they were before, and someone for sure, Eutychus, now has a testimony of a God that overcomes death. And Paul preaches until daylight. And guys, I'm so jealous of that, but not for the reason you think. Um, my flesh would not like to speak for 12 hours. But my spirit, let me tell you about my spirit. I have had really crummy days in retail, which I don't have anymore, yay, thank God. Um, But I've had days where I'd have 12 hour shifts and I'd be dead on my feet, both overnight shifts and stuff. And then someone would tell me, someone that I would work with would go, hey, you're a pastor. What does it mean when God, da, 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 they'd ask me a question. And I'll never forget, someone asked me, you're like, I heard about this, what's a prodigal? I heard a prodigal son get referenced. What does that mean? And I was, I was tired. I was sleepy. I did not want to be there. And they said that. And I literally, I perk up and I'm like, are you talking about the prodigal son in the Bible? I guess, I don't know, what does that mean? There were two sons. <laughs> and I'm like, in it. <laughs> and I, something comes alive in me. There's preaching, there's, there's getting up and there's reading. There, there's, there's nothing wrong or bad with his reading scripture. There's not. But man, when you're explaining it, when you're focused on understanding it, that's the key. You got to do more than read scripture. You got to seek to understand it and then to hide it in your heart and let the Holy Spirit draw it out of you to share it with others and to explain it to them. That's what Paul's doing right now. And so he just keeps going and going and going and he's excited. And I love that he gets his second win. They go back. They basically have second church like second breakfast, like they break the bread again and they take the cup and they do communion all over again. It's like church round two, starting at 12.01. Woo, we got Eutychus back, he's alive now. All right, second church. When you can start quoting scripture, when you can start, yeah, telling about the glory of God and and, and telling about, you know, the, the, the Bible hits as I like to call them. 
um, you know, David and Goliath, Shadrach, Meshach, and the Abednego, when you can just tell the story of a God that loves us, starting from Genesis 1-1, when he spoke and God created to the promise of the return of his son. Everything in there is good and worth remembering and worth focusing on, and your flesh will say, it's been five minutes. Are we done? But your spirit is shouting for more because your spirit knows that you're going to forget most of everything we talked about today five minutes into the car ride home. So when your spirit says, shut up and let me have this to your flesh, just run with it. If your spirit, if you have that thing where you're just like, yep, yep, I need this, I need to hear this, lean into it. Tell your flesh to shut up. Try that. Try shouting down your flesh when it tries to keep you from opening your Bible or spending time in prayer or keeping your eyes open in church. Tell your flesh, shut up and let me have this. Your spirit wants it. Your spirit wants the things of God desperately and yet we starve it all the time. We give it little morsels here and there, but we're meant to keep a healthy diet of the word of God, prayer and discipleship. So tell your flesh, shut up and let me have this. I need it. That hole in my heart that can only be filled by time with my creator. It can't be filled with the things of this world, the things my flesh would rather be spending time with. Those things will not last. God's things are eternal. The things of the world will not satisfy. The only thing that will last is Jesus. Nobody, die on me now, I got more preaching to do. Verse 13. We, <laughs> Kelly, you're awesome. Um, we went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going, I'm not going to say it the other way, where we were going to take Paul aboard. If you've got eyes on scripture, you know why that's funny. He made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard <laughs> and went on to Mytilene. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived at Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day arrived at Miletus. These are all great baby names, by the way. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So Paul has backtracked here so much. He's going to pass Ephesus, where he started this trip from, uh, remember the top of Acts 20 in this chapter. He started out from there. But they got a little bit of time at Miletus before they carry on. So Paul tells the elders of the church to come to him because guess what he wants to do? He wants to encourage them. Verse 18, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came to the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks, that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. What Paul says there, um, it sounds like a paradox, right? He says, you know, I've, I've done this with great humility. Whenever you share the gospel, guys, do it with great humility. I, I know that seems like a, a strange thing to put together, those two words. Um, but when Paul says it, I believe it. Because the Saul that had been, back when Paul was known as Saul, he was going around sharing the Torah. He, he knew scripture. He knew the Old Testament. And he went around with great pomp and circumstance, with great pride in his heart, saying, 
you're doing it wrong. Everybody's doing it wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to show you how to do it right. And if you don't do it right, I'm going to throw you in prison. That's what he would do. But the Paul, uh, that Saul died on the road of Damascus and became this humble Paul that we now read about that remembers that moment the scales fell from blind eyes. And now all he does is serve. All he does is go from place to place, testifying to the goodness of God, planting churches, being a disciple maker. And whatever God wants, that's what he's doing. That is humility, guys. It takes great humility to say, not what I want, but what you want, God. Please note the tears that Paul talks about. Um, There were times of mourning. Paul has seen a lot. And he never stopped giving God praise, even in the stocks in a jail cell. But there were times of tears. This is an important thing for us to remember. God does not call us to put on a false face and pretend like things aren't hard from time to time. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. When one of us mourns, we all mourn. Paul speaks of a season of severe testing by people who had it out for them in a time of mourning. But notice that through those tears, Paul did not hesitate to preach anything. Did not hesitate to preach anything that would not be helpful. Declaring that all must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. The thing about mourning is this. Because guys, I have gone through uh, many a season of mourning. I mean, my, my wife and I, we have we've gone through some long seasons. I recall one that lasted, for me specifically, about six months. And uh, I remember it was a visible thing. I was still working at Pilot at the time, and I was usually for... Most often I'd go in there and I'd be a a bright ray of sunshine. I'd be like, I'm going to love everybody today. And often people would be like, please stop. And I'd be like, no, I have to. Um, But but our family came under attack in 2015. And uh, I did. I wrestled for about six months. And I remember a, a, a worker there that did not know God. She still saw. She was still impacted just by the morning, the time of morning that I was going through. And she came to me and she just knew something wasn't right. And I really appreciated what she did next. She didn't say, fake it. She didn't say, well, you know, just try to put a smile on your face anyway. And she didn't say, well, it'll be okay tomorrow. You'll feel better tomorrow. She sat with me in it. She mourned while I mourned. It's a powerful thing to do. But our mourning, guys, this is the important thing. Our mourning should not keep us from the presence of God and doing what he would call us to do. There's that humility part again, where we have to get out of our own way, even out of the way of our flesh, because the gospel prevails. Even as things don't go our way, they certainly haven't been going the way that we look at Paul's journey and we're like, that's terrible. This is terrible things happening to him again and again and again. But Paul knows this that his body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in Paul, and it lives in us. And hell cannot hold him back. So what chance does the devil have if he comes against the place where God's Spirit dwells? None. Verse 22. And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. 
I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. We talk about humility right there. Um, That's it on display, full force. Paul tells these men, God has told me it's going to get harder, but I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race that Jesus has set before me. To know God and to make him known. That's what matters. That's what he's going to do. Guys, pray constantly. If anything, if, if you wake up and you're like, everything's great and bright and sunshiny and all my needs are met, pray still that you get out of your own way. If everything is falling apart around you and nothing is lining up in the way that you would like to have it go, pray that you can get out of your own way. That you can lay your life down and pick up the task Jesus has given you and rest assured he's given you one. He's put someone on your heart. He's given you gifts and talents to accomplish things for his kingdom. He has sent you to be a blessing to someone. Are we getting out of our own way so that we can run that race that Jesus has set before us? Humility, humility, humility. God, not about me, about you. Jesus set that precedence in the Garden of Gethsemane. Every time we meet with God, it's about him. Every morning we wake up with breath in our lungs, the breath that he put there, let us make that day about serving our Lord Jesus. We have to tell our flesh, shut up. Let me have this. It's not my flesh's race, it's God's. He's got a place I need to be today and tomorrow and the next day until one day I have finished that race and there will be before me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will appoint to me on that day and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Those are the words of Paul to Timothy shortly before his execution by Nero. Paul doesn't know the future, but he knows he'll never see the elders of this church of Ephesus again on this earth. Verse 25, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today, that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Paul's saying, every chance I had, I preached my face off. I discipled. The rest is up to you. It's each and everyone's choice to be hearers and doers of the word. It's easy to sit here on Sunday and hear the word, but it's a whole different thing to get up and live it outside these four walls. That's also a thing when I was at school and I had my salvation experience at camp and God got a hold of me and shook me up. I went back into school a changed person, realizing that, oh, time is short and fleeting and I have only so much time to love people and to share the, with him the gospel. Um, we do. You, you have so much time at college, gentlemen. You have only so much time with the people that you're going to be around. Um, you have to make the most of it. We have to make the most of it where the jobs that we're at, um, with the children that we're raising. Uh, you have only so much time to be around with the spouse that you have, to keep loving and encouraging them. Um, so, so do, make, make every, every moment count. Lay down your flesh time and time again, seeking after the kingdom of God and setting out on that race that he has before you. To know God, to make, to make God known. Verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers 
Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Guys, there's a lot of heresy out there. Lies about how you can get to heaven or earn God's love or saying that Jesus was only a man or that he, didn't, he wasn't raised from the dead or that you can do whatever you want because Jesus is letting everyone into heaven. All it takes is a little twist of scripture or ignore this, this passage or this whole book um, and you can create a whole different understanding of God that is a complete fabrication of, of who he is. If it's not from Scripture, it is a distortion of truth that will draw people away from God. We are to be on guard from that in the church. We are to not just let anyone get up and speak doctrine because we don't know if it will be sound. It's one of the reasons I love Open Bible, which is our denomination, uh, is that they vet you. Uh, you want to be a pastor? Prove that you know the Word of God and are living it. This also lines up with Scripture, according to Pauline epistles. A lot of denominations live by that, which is great. It is important to take what I say from the pulpit and weigh it against Scripture. It's why so often I'm like, read it with me. Put your eyes on it with me. And I thank God so many times Roots Youth Group has been like, no! <laughs> is that, you've misquoted that, or that was the wrong chapter and verse. I love that. Uh, I love that we read it together. Um, Guard against false teaching and wolves among the flock. There are going to be people in church that do not have the things of God in mind. I've done ministry with them throughout my many, many years of, of being in churches. Uh, at many places, Paul has been. Paul would begin, uh, people would then begin to preach a false gospel after he would leave. And that is still the case today. We have to be on guard. We have to be alert. Again, that is telling your flesh to shut up and let God be God. Stick to Scripture. Verse 32. Now I commit to you, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. And so here we're about to begin in Acts. Uh, we're going to see the beginning of the end of Paul's ministry. And it's amazing how we get to see a lot of prophetic stuff happen here where God told Paul, I'm going to send you to kings. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the gospel spread in, in like you have never seen before. Paul is going to get some amazing opportunities. He's also going to endure some of the worst hardships we've seen so far that make the other stuff look super easy. Um, through it all, through it all, Paul never stops, never stops encouraging people. Even people that don't deserve encouraging Oh, he's going to encourage them harder. And it's amazing. Um, so right now I tell you this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you understand what that means, that it is his heart to bless you. 
because he loves you. He cares about you. He has good for you. It doesn't mean this world is easy, but it means that God is with you and he has a place prepared for you. May his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he know that he sees you, that he forgives a multitude of sins, and that as he turns his face towards you, it's that reminder that we turn from sin to God. Lord, help us come to our senses day in and day out. Help us to die to our flesh. Help us to respond to our spirit. Help us to turn to you the way you turn to us. And through that, in that, we have an all-encompassing peace that you give, God. You supply, like only you can. That even in the midst of the storm, even when everything else is going on, even in times of joy and mourning, there is peace because you have your face turned towards us and we see you and we acknowledge you and we know that you have us. In Jesus' name, amen.